Well, I'm with my good friend and business partner uh, in culture. For years now. For years now. Nine years to be exact, right. I think. Yep. Um, uh, so Tim O'Neill, CEO and president of Goodwill of Central and Northern Arizona, and also CEO of Thrive Services Group. Yes. And uh, this is sort of a special uh, occasion uh, for me personally, because we just reached our 30th year in business. And uh, we wanted to do something a little different than just simply writing a check or you know, bringing our team together and go doing a big vacation. We wanted to somehow acknowledge a person who embodies the kind of work that we're trying to um, help organizations uh, model and achieve. And when I asked the group, okay, what should we do? And, and we all said, well, let's do an award. And so we created what will be our uh, annual uh, award for, um, for excellence in leadership. And when we said, well, who's the right person for this? We all said, without a doubt, Tim O'Neill. So Tim, I'm just so pleased to be able to, you know, have you be our inaugural award winner. And this will be something we do every year from here on out. And um, I'm just so proud of what you've done over the last, well, many, many years, but for the nine years that I've known you, it's just been an incredible ride. You know, I am beyond honored and you and your team have been a true gift to me and to our organization. The culture transformation that's happened while you and I've been together is something I really think is, is pretty um, special. Watching the organization kind of blossom and be something that it probably could have never been had we not worked on these things together. And just again, you know, the friendship that we've had and the way that you've helped us build a culture where it's like family, mm -hmm. where people actually care about each other. You know, we're 6,000 people strong right now. And it's still amazing how there's still that small company feel to it. And I mm -hmm. think that's a real credit to the work that we've done. When we first had lunch at many years ago, yes. the word that came out of your mouth was servant leadership. And I know that's a word that people use a lot, but I'm curious about your perspective on that now that you've gone through this whole culture change work over the last nine years. Some people think that servant leadership is certainly about engagement, but also about kind of consensus, meaning that we all have to agree on everything. I think that you've actually uh, embodied that well, but at the same time, you're not afraid to be bold. You're not afraid to have a vision, not afraid to quote unquote lead. So can you kind of share a little bit about how you've been able to blend vision and being bold with servitude to others? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's about being selfless and, and that's an easy thing to say. It's a hard thing to do. You know, for us, one thing that we talk about in organizations is that we all have different positions that we do, different job titles, but nobody's more important than the next person. And I think that's something that, that's very special. And you don't see that often. At least I, when I say that to people, they say, gosh, I've never heard of it, heard it put that way before. But it, that's what it feels like to me. And it's this idea that if you're the leader, the number one job you have is to take care of your people. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, they take care of everything else. And it really has worked out that way for us, where we've got all these wonderful people at every kind of range of level that you could think about in their careers. And each one of them is making a special impact in the community every day because of what they do. And if you don't treat them that way, then shame on you as a leader. So I think we really tried to do that. We've studied with you servant leadership, obviously the five dysfunctions of a team, mm -hmm. so many different great learnings that we've gone through. And we try to push that through the entire organization. So it's not just you and I talking about it. It's the entire leadership team. It's the entire management group. Management for us is over 400 people. And to get that many minds to kind of going in the right direction takes a lot of work. But it, the most important thing you can do is make sure that they know for you as the leader, that's always more about them than it's ever going to be about you. When I think about the beginnings of this little company that started in 1992, uh, somewhere around July of that year, uh, it was pivotal for me because I got fired from my waiting job. <laughs> and uh, Joanne, my wife, uh, as you know, uh, the lipo, lady, the, the the lipo gal, she said, this is the best thing that ever happened to you. And I went, are you kidding me? But in that same particular month, uh, I got my first coaching client, which is a guy named Michael Rosenberg, who went on to becoming a portrait photographer, of the presidents of the United States, wow. by Barack Obama, for example. But also, we, I did my first facilitation, which was around purpose. And it was, I think it was called Design Your Life Purpose. Just a simple little $35 a head kind of thing that just to kind of get me started. Purpose seems to be a through line in my life and a through line in our work. Tell me about what your purpose is as a leader and how you've been able to bring others along. Sure. Um, well, you know, I've, I've been asked this a lot lately about, you know, what drives you and why is the mission of serving people in the community so important to you? And it, it wasn't always that way. Hmm. I mean, you know, as a kid, I was kind of rough and kind of out on my own early and had to develop through my career. And the only thing I thought about was I needed a job. Yeah. Right? And then I found this beautiful gift called Goodwill. 
and got to meet these amazing people that come in every day and just work as hard as they can. And they just want to be recognized and appreciated for the work that they do. And when you see that many people over and over and over, just want to, to know that they're doing a good job and that you're there to make sure that they're taken care of, it makes me feel like it's, it's a very special thing. And so the purpose for me is always about the community. It's always about our team. And it's this idea that, you know, really, no matter what people think, you can make a difference. We can make, you and I, we can make a difference. We yeah. can make a difference. And that purpose of just trying to take care of your fellow human is something I, I think that um, more people should do. I wish more people would do it. And, you know, for me, the purpose is let's make sure we're all taken care of together. There's so much divisiveness out there and it just doesn't have to be that way. And so for me, having a chance to meet so many people that have had tremendous struggles in their lives and they pull themselves up every day, work as hard as they can and just want to know that they're doing a good job. Yeah. You know, last night we went to the Coyotes game. We did. And uh, we talked to the, the CEO of that organization, Javier, good man. Javier, great man. And uh, it came really clear that this was a conversation, not just about thrift retail or about uh, pucks and goals and so forth. This was about building a community. And it seems like you've done a, a really tremendous job in, in the Phoenix area and growing beyond to be able to align yourself with other purpose-centered leaders and, and really developing a great sort of larger family, if you will, around giving back to the community. You know, it, it's, this is, I'm still amazed <laughs> to this day at, at how many people we've been able to attract in terms of this idea of, of servant leadership, um, this idea of serving your fellow man. And most leaders, even if they don't realize it, that's what they want. They mm. want to be, they want to be a good person. They want to do good things for the people around them. And Javier is one of those guys. When we first sat down, when we started talking about these concepts of changing the world and ending poverty, he got it. He got it immediately. Mm. He said, that's exactly, that's exactly what we want to do. That's what our team wants to represent. That's the brand that we want to showcase is that we're not a sports team. We're here to help make the community the best place it can be. Mm. And of course, at that moment, I went, that's exactly what we're here for. Right. We're here not, not to run thrift retail. We're here to be this great organization that serves your fellow man in the best way that that's possible. And so Javier is a great community partner, but we've been so fortunate. And I always say this, people say, how did you do this? And I, the answer is, I don't know. I just, I've just been really lucky. We seem to attract great people. But I, I believe that vision. I believe that vision of, of trying to make sure that you're changing the world. And I mean that. I do mean changing the yeah. world. It, it's something that people gravitate to. And like-minded people immediately come together for that. You know, the world changed dramatically a few years ago with the pandemic. And you guys that were goodwill uh, took a bold stand and said, we're all going to come back to work, even those who are not needing to. Talk about that a little bit and how you're able to get um, the organization around that. There are still organizations today that are still struggling with that. And we're kind of coming off of COVID. Well, so we were really fortunate. Um, we were shut down for a short period of time in our governor. Uh, was very generous and allowed us to reopen as an essential business. And so we were only shut down for a short period of time. But remember that, that Goodwill, 85% of our business is made up of retail. And so that means that people in the community, our, our employees had to go out and work in harm's way every day. And so when you think about the makeup of the 6,000 people and 80 plus percent of them are in the retail side of what we do, to think that the corporate staff is just going to be able to stay home, mm. and that's that's you don't want to live in an ivory tower, especially in those kinds of jobs. And so I felt it was a responsibility that that everybody come back. And one of the things we did as a leadership team, the, the C level and vice president level, we made a commitment we were going to be in the office every single normal workday, mm. even through COVID, unless mm. it was somebody who was a high risk person. We had those folks stay home. But for the rest of us, we were there and we were having strategy meetings every single morning, eight o'clock, getting ready and trying to understand what the landscape of the world looked like. What we also did is myself and our chief operating officer, we had, we made it a priority that we went out into the stores. Hmm. We didn't just stay at the corporate hmm. office. We actually went out and we toured our stores to talk to the employees and, and to talk, even talk to the customers. And what was fascinating was um, people would come up and I've been with Goodwill 24 years now. and Never really had this happen, but but we reopened and people were coming up and this is COVID <laughs> and they're hugging us and they're thanking us for reopening. The people, the, the employees, I didn't know what I was going to do without a job. My spouse was laid off. We had mm. no income. We weren't going to be able to feed our families. Customers, I couldn't afford to go to somewhere else. I needed to come here. Thank you so much. And it happened time and time and time again to the point that that was one of those moments when I realized, gosh, Goodwill isn't just a name. It's kind of a community resource. And um, 
for me, that stance was never even a question. It's, and that comes back to this, we all have different job titles, but nobody's more important than the next person. If you work in a corporate facility and all your people are out in the field in harm's way and something like that, and you don't feel a responsibility to come back into the office, to show up just like they have to, then I mean, that, how can you how can you call yourself a leader? So is that your recommendation to organizations that are still working through this? I will tell you that, you know, um, it was very hard for us. It was probably one of the best things we ever did. All, through all the tragedy of COVID, we have grown. We've doubled in size mm. in two and a half years. And I think that's because while everybody else stayed home, and we actually had this, some of our competitors, even some of our partners stayed home. And, mm. and what they chose to do is, is on their websites, even a, a few uh, governmental agencies call goodwill. And so we were, we were inundated with people needing our help. And um, those organizations that, that stayed closed, I've actually seen a lot of them go out of business and we've grown. And so I, I don't know if it's a recommendation, but I will just tell you our results have been the best they've ever been over the last really two and a half years now. So there's a article I saw recently in the Wall Street Journal that said that most CEOs of large organizations these days are saying that, yes, we are going to be running into a recession here pretty soon if Absolutely. we're not already in it now. Yeah. What lessons do you think we should take from the COVID experience that we shouldn't forget as we enter into this next series of what could be headwinds? Well, you know, I, I think that recession wise, Goodwill is an interesting business because in good times, more people than ever donate to us. Hmm. In bad times, more people than ever shop us, right? Hmm. Um, so when we look at this, we talk more about the way that we see social services and from the impact around the recession, you're going to see unemployment go up. Hmm. And more importantly than that, I think you're going to see the wage gap increase where more people than ever aren't going to be able to afford um, daily life. And so I would just say that as a leader, make sure you're doing the right things to take care of your team members. Hmm. Make sure that you're doing the right things to ensure the organization have, has enough cash to weather any kind of storm that comes up. If you're in the real estate world at all, brick and mortar, obviously that will probably change dramatically in the next 18 months. And so be careful with the real estate decisions you're making today. Um, but really, I mean, overall, it's just caution. You know, anytime you come into something like this, caution, but also, you know, something like this can create great opportunities. Hmm. We know for us that when recessions hit and because we have more customers than ever, when the real estate market goes down, other retailers go out of business. Yeah. And that is our perfect opportunity to grow. So I think being, being very cautious about how you run your business and how you enter a time like this, but at the same time, don't miss the opportunities. Hmm. When we decided to do this award, we wanted to figure out what the criteria was. And the one that really showed up was that making culture change and culture development a strategic priority. And it really seems like, from my perspective, you've always been steadfast on that. When that comes to play, what sort of ways can you justify that from a business perspective? I know we've talked about this before. Some people go, oh, we're going to another culture event. I, I should get, I should be just, I should be quote unquote working, right? That's where the money is. That's where the services are to our community. Why am I doing this? How have you been able to make that argument that the culture actually is good for business? Well, COVID, I think, <laughs> I think COVID was a great example. You know, even, I mean, in, in June of 2020, you were there with me. Mm -hmm. uh, we brought our leadership team and our board back together. We yeah. said, show up in person because we know that if we let the culture fall apart, that the organization is going to fall apart. And, you know, one of the reasons we weathered that so well, I'm confident, is because we were meeting and mm. we were talking and mm. we were breaking bread together, which is, you know, the basis of culture. Culture is not just about learning. Some of the best experiences you can ever have are when the day ends and you're all out having dinner together. You're all just having a chance to talk and to catch up, storytell about the lore of the organization, vision about what you want to see the organization be. And so that that was a great example of, of we didn't back down and we made sure that our, our, our team kept informed and kept together. Hmm. But also, and uh, you know this very well, we had one year where some of our senior leaders said, well, the budget's tight. We should really cut back on these culture events. Yep. And I listened. And guess what? It was our worst year in my tenure as the CEO. Mm. And is that a direct correlation or not? I don't know, but it absolutely happened that way. And we put the culture events back in uh, the next year and revenues went right back up. Wow. You talk about storytelling. Is there a particular event, story, exercise uh, happening that took place in the last nine years that comes to mind when you think about this is what it's like to build culture? Well, over the nine years, there's been so many but you know when we do these you know, we don't 
necessarily go away to fancy resorts. We go sometimes and sit around a campfire. Yeah. And some of those campfire stories are the best things I can remember where people are talking about the organization, um, talking about the things we do in the community. One of the best things is, you know, a lot of us, I, I came from a competitor who I worked for when I was very young. A lot of the people that, that are on our senior team, I recruited and came from that same competitor. And for years, we all told stories about when we were in that, in that, in that competitor's employee. And there was a moment at one of these campfires when somebody said, you know what's special about this is? We don't tell those old stories anymore. We mm. tell our own stories mm. about this organization. And that's those artifacts, that lore is, is really what makes the company strong. Yeah. So that was an incredible moment. I'll go the other way and I'll tell you one of the most memorable things I ever saw where it was a terrible culture. Because for years here uh, in Goodwill, we were struggling and the organization was bankrupt. We had to really repair it. And it took a long time to do that. But one of our original culture events, long before you, I'm mm -hmm. sure you've heard this story, mm -hmm. is we had we had our senior leaders come together for the first time to try to do team building and games, right? And there was a thing called a team ski. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever done it, it's one of those things where you have to all work together, you have to all communicate, you have to all listen and respect each other and the abilities in order to move these skis, wooden, wooden, you know, two by fours, 12 feet long, ropes on them. So you lift them and you move and you ski on them. And we started to try to do this exercise of the senior leaders, vice presidents, people that should be good at culture and communicate. And it was so uh, unsuccessful. Mm. You had our CFO throw the ropes down and walk off. You had our vice president of HR go and sit on a stump by himself. Mm. And a few of us stayed and tried to figure out how to get the team ski to work. And we ultimately did. But that is an example. When you have that kind of, of distrust of each other or lack of desire to, to see the team succeed, you know the organization is broken. And, and we were. And that's one of the reasons why you and um, what we do together, I think, has been so transformative is when you go from a culture like that, and I know you've heard a lot of our senior team talk about what it was like before I got into my, my current role. Um, but when you have a culture like that, performance reflects it. And, uh, and you know, you'll hear a lot of CEOs say, nah, not true, not true, not true. I will tell you it's because they've never tried it. They've never put the real effort into it. They've never built a team around culture, around good communication, around good transparency. You know, we do these things with our board. Mm -hmm. We don't just do them as a senior team. We want to be so transparent that our board of directors, and we have four different boards, <clears throat> they're all involved in these things so that the team knows that the board is just as invested, and the board are volunteers, by the way, that the board is just as invested in the culture and transparency and communication as a team's expected to be. So I think, I think it's definitely something that is transformative and a good example of what good culture looks like, at least for me, and an example of what terrible culture looks like from personal experience. You mentioned the board. I've never been with any other organization that has had such a relationship with its board. It's usually those are the people that we don't talk to. Go through the CEO if you have any questions. It's almost like a separate entity that you know it's there, but you never interact with. It's, yeah. The board really has become part of the one team at Goodwill. That was the whole intent. And, you know, I've, I've actually seen it this way because I've had a, had a chance to work for a few different CEOs in yeah. my life. And um, I never saw a single one of them say, please go talk to the board. Yeah. And that's completely the opposite of the way I feel. As a matter of fact, our board chair and the vice chairman, they talk to my senior team one-on-one -on -one all the time mm -hmm. without me there. They have one-on-one -on -one conversations about me. Um, and then what they'll do is they'll measure. Is, is, does the team know what Tim's really thinking in his mind? Every year so far, luckily, we've, we've all been on the same page. Mm -hmm. But that's that transparency. Yeah. And I've had new senior executives come into the business and they say, um, one of the board members asked me to lunch. Is that okay? Of course it's okay yeah i mean really unless you've got secrets you don't want your 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 uh, peers and, and your board to know about why wouldn't you want them to communicate it saves you the hassle of having to relay those messages over and over yeah and so we've done that and i have been gifted with probably the most amazing board any ceo could ask for ours are very much about one team they don't see themselves as as the hierarchy of the organization they see themselves as part of it and that comes back to this whole idea everybody has a different position nobody's more important than next and our board embodies that every day so tim just to sort of finish up and i know we've got some food here to eat and you've got a day to uh get into as well what real message do you want people to take away when they deal with you if there was a sentence if there was a tagline if there was a purpose this is what my point of view is i wish everybody got it what would that be it's going to sound corny but love your fellow person 
No, it's I not really, corny. I really think that's important. And I think that as a leader, if you don't do that, you don't have any business leading. Yep. And so for me, it's always that love, family, and take care of take care of the people around you. Well, my friend, you are part of my family. As, and as I, I'm so pleased to have you in my life. And it's been a real joy. Thank you, sir. Yep. Well done. Thank you.